Hey, welcome back. It's the preacher, and this is going to be another episode of cool old stuff. And this stuff is classifies as really cool because it's got a lot of history behind it. I found it. It's genuinely old. I think if my math is correct, it's a hundred. Golly, thirty. It's like 158 years old. Is that right? I think that's right. Anyways, let me tell you about it. First of all, let me give you the backstory. What I have here, I'm at the reloading bench. What do you have at the reloading bench? Bullets, right? I have some Civil War bullets. And so that's cool in and of itself. But here's what's even cooler than just I have some Civil War bullets. I found them. And I found them with my own metal detector. And that's a, it's a battle that took place near where I live. And I did some research. And... Uh, Anyway, let me just tell you the story. Let me, let me give you the background. I'm excited about this stuff. I've had these for a couple of years. I wanted to do a video on them for a couple of years. I never got around to it. Here it is. These are bullets that I found at the Battle of Dripping Springs, which really wasn't much of a battle, uh, even though about 4,000 people took, took part in it. It was really just a short skirmish. But what happened was, after Prairie Grove, there was a battle... Uh, just west of Fayetteville, present-day Fayetteville, Arkansas, at a place called Prairie Grove. And at Prairie Grove, a Union force and a Confederate force fought, and both forces had several thousand men. This was a major bloody conflict, and the Confederates lost. And <clears throat> Confederate General Hindman, on December the 7th, uh, in the middle of the night, just did a tactical withdrawal and pulled all of his troops out of Prairie Grove. He couldn't continue to stay and fight on the field. He had a lot of men uh, wounded. He had a high uh, casualty of sickness. Sickness was sweeping through his army at the time. He had a lot of men who were too sick to fight. And then he had lost a good deal of uh, people to uh, war and, and to being captured. And so he thought the best thing for him to do would be get out of Northwest Arkansas, retreat and go to the Arkansas River and use the river as a boundary that, since he had a smaller, weaker force and make the, the Union cross the Arkansas River. So he retreated south on December 7th, 1862 to Van Buren, Arkansas, which is right on the Arkansas River. And then he began to ferry his men across the river to the Fort Smith side and to put them in a safer position. So they did this. The, the Union didn't immediately follow suit. And so uh, they began to fortify uh, Fort Smith and prepare for battle there. And they used Van Buren as kind of a, a line of defense and a way of gathering supplies. There were train tracks on that side of the river. And so uh, there were a lot of supplies being brought into Van Buren. And they were trying to get all they could in case the Union advanced south. There wouldn't be anything there for the Union to take. But on December the 27th, when no one expected it, General Blunt and General Heron of the uh, Union, who controlled the troops in Prairie Grove, decided to attack Van Buren. And so no one expected this because there was four to, four to eight inches, depending on who you read and probably where you were. Some areas got four inches, some areas got eight inches. And the way that you came from Prairie Grove to Van Buren was over the Boston Mountains, which are a really tall, rugged uh, mountain range within the Ozark Mountains range, the larger Ozark Mountain range. The Boston Mountains are really, really high uh, peaks that you have to cross. And with there being snow and ice on the mountains, the, the Confederates said, you know, if, they, if they're going to come down here, they're going to wait till the snow melts, so we're good. But... They left in the middle of the night, 8,000 men with 30 pieces of artillery crossed the Boston Mountains in the dark. Now, this is a large army crossing rugged territory, which would be a feat in and of itself, and they marched all day and all night. <clears throat> but what made it so amazing is they did it with ice and snow on the mountains, and the roads were covered in ice and snow, and the men had to cross creeks. Uh, there's a, uh, several pretty good sized creeks that run through those mountains. 
And uh, by one soldier's account, as they came through um, Cave Springs, uh, not Cave Springs, as they came through Cove Creek, which is a small creek, the Cove Creek Road follows the creek. The road crosses the creek 33 times. And those soldiers went through water 33 times. And the accounts of the water of Cove Creek, I fished on Cove Creek, it's cold. It keeps smallmouth bass in it year round. But it was so cold then, the river had chunks of ice and slushy ice all the way through the creek. So they crossed that 33 times in the dark. Their cannons, at one point in time, they used 12 horses and 50 men to pull one cannon over a hill. That's how steep the roads were, how icy they were. These Union troops worked all night knowing they needed the element of surprise. Because if, if, if it took them days to get here, the Confederates could come and find a high place and, and set up a defense outside of there. If they knew that's the direction they were going to come was over the Boston Mountains and not, say, further to the east or to the west. So the element of surprise is what they, they sought, and they got it. They arrived at Oliver's store at 3 a.m. in the morning, and they had ran into a few pickets, but they never really saw the troops. And a lot of the men, instead of trying to outrun these troops through eight inches of snow back toward Van Buren, they just simply fled up into the hills to get away because they knew they couldn't get back to Van Buren. Well, at Oliver's store, uh, General Blunt and Hindman, or not Hindman, General Blunt and uh, General Herring learned that there was an outpost of a thousand cavalrymen at a place called Dripping Springs. So, rather than trying to move the entire army to Dripping Springs, Blunt and Herring gathered up 3,000 cavalrymen. These are 3,000 horse troops. They also gave them four howitzer artillery and sent them ahead of the main army at a double time so they would arrive at daylight. And so at daylight, these men arrived at the battlefield of Dripping Springs. Now, let me describe the battlefield of Dripping Springs. Dripping Springs has a spring that drips, okay? It still drips. And there's a large, a large steep ridge there, and the springs are here, and there's a break in that ridge where the springs, and that's where the road would come from um, Oliver's store, which is to the north, and would come right through Dripping Springs, this little break in the ridge. And there were a thousand cavalrymen stationed there on that ridge with the idea of being able to look out across these flat fields in front of them. It was just a flat spot on top, on, on some high ground. It was flat for a long ways. And so on the morning of December 28th at sunrise, these cavalrymen who were stationed there to kind of be an outward buffer and maybe to hold the troops up and get word to Van Buren that y'all need to get across the river, these men woke up to 3,000 cavalrymen and eight howitz, four howitzers lining up across the field for battle. So, who were these cavalrymen? These were the first Texas partisan rangers. They were rounded up by Colonel Lane in East Texas. But at this current time, they were under the second in command, which was Lieutenant Colonel R.P. or R. Philip Crump. And so Crump roused his men out of bed. I mean, many of them were getting dressed when someone spotted the Union troops lining up. So all these men quickly mounted their horses, quickly formed a battle line at the pinch point where the road broke through the ridge. And they were going to, to line up and fight, and he sent some people with horses back to go ahead, and they were going to try to hold them off as long as they could. Well, there's a thousand partisan rangers from Texas, or the first Texas cavalry is what some accounts call them. They're there, and they're outnumbered three to one, plus they have no artillery. Plus, they're fresh out of bed. Many of the men are still trying to get their horses lined up. And so a couple of volleys of shots are fired back and forth. The, uh, the Texans fire, the Union fire, depending on whose account you read, some say that the the, the, the Confederates fired three times and the Union two times. Some say that the Confederates fired once and ran. And that may just be on which end of the line you were on because I think as soon as the Confederate troops realized how overwhelmed they were, 
they said, hey, if we're going to live, we're going we're to need to get back to Van Buren in a hurry. Because getting to Van Buren wasn't a safe haven. Getting to Van Buren mean that, meant that you now needed to get across the Arkansas River. And so uh, these men began to fall back. And every time they would fall back, if they found high ground, these, these Texas cavalrymen would, would skirmish. They would set up at high ground. They would shoot and stop the advance, then retreat. Another group would be set up. So it was designed to be a tactical withdrawal from Dripping Springs to Van Buren. I don't really have anything from the Battle of Van Buren, but what I will tell you is when the Union arrived there, they set up an artillery, uh, 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 I don't know what you call that. I was in the Air Force, we don't shoot ground cannons. They set up a, a, a bank of artillery in the cemetery on the hillside above Van Buren and from the cemetery consider, it continued to shell the city and uh, sunk a couple of steamboats and, and uh, the, the Confederates all got on the other side of the river on Fort Smith. So, back to Dripping Springs. I find, I'm reading this account, I'm wanting to go find Civil War bullets. I know there's a, uh, a little monument out on the highway here on this date in December 28th, 1862, Battle of Dripping Springs, but when you read the accounts, they don't look nothing like where the monument is out on the highway. When you read the accounts of the two armies as they came together, it looks more like it's where actual the Dripping Springs are. And so I had a, a lady in our church that lived there, and I said, hey, do you, has anybody ever metal detected around you? No, no, not that I know of. You want to come out and try it? I said, I sure do. So I went out and tried it. And on the very first time I went, I found this bullet. This is the first Civil War bullet I ever found. I'll bring you in closer in a minute. This is called a three ring mini ball. And uh, it's 56 caliber. This is in a perfect condition. It was dropped. It was never loaded, never fired. So it looks exactly the way it did when it came out of the mold. Some of you bullet casters may be interested <laughs> in how well the Confederate molds look. I do believe this to be a Confederate bullet. It could be a Union bullet. They both shot the same bullets. And on that same day, I found this, which looks like a half of a pistol ball that was fired. Of course, it hit a rock or a tree or maybe even somebody. But I do have some, uh, some rifling grooves in the side of the ball, so it does tell me that it was fired. And... Uh, it looks to be as, as antique and ancient as the others. I went back at a later date. I, fired, I found a fired three-ring mini ball. You can still see the rings on the side of it. And then I went back on a third trip and found another smashed three-ring mini ball that probably hit into a tree. But uh, I, saw, I, I found these four bullets in that battle. I did all that research myself. I read all the stories. I went and looked for where I thought the action took place. I looked for what the two generals described or the colonel and the general were describing. I, 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 I thought this is where the Confederates camped. Now one thing about those Confederates, when they realized they were outnumbered three to one and facing artillery, they fled. And they left breakfast cooking on the campfire. They left wagons and mules. Uh, they left all their clothes. As a matter of fact, if you read the accounts of the 1st Texan Partisan Regiment, Mounted Regiment, Calvary, after this battle or this little skirmish, they have to go, uh, they have to travel a few towns away to find more clothes because they don't, they don't have anything. They left with literally the shirts on their back. So that's what leads me to believe that this is a dropped Confederate cavalry bullet because they left a lot of stuff there. And uh, I think somebody said there was a blacksmith uh, wagon there and uh, he had left his anvil, his, all of his blacksmith and tools, all of his horseshoes, everything that was, was there. I mean, no one expected there to be an attack in six to eight inches of snow um, at, at that time of year. Nobody expected that approach. And so the element of surprise is what clearly gave the Union the victory. Plus, they were dealing with a demoralized and really uh, very weakened Confederate uh, military at that time. So let me bring you in close. I'll show you these bullets and uh, give you a look at some cool old stuff. 
Got these laid out on a uh, black roan cape that my dad shot in Africa. Let me show you first of all, we we'll get a look at this three ring mini ball. As I said, the condition of this has dropped. There's no rifling marks on it. You still see the pinch at the top where it came out of the mold. The bottom was hollow and when the powder was fired that would cause this to swell and, and embrace the rifling. So it made for easy loading and accurate shooting and you hear many ball, but ball was just the word for ammunition. And uh, the rings here and the oblong conical shape is what gave it its accuracy and preferred um, bullet for the Civil War. So that's a very good, I did that little scratch when I dug it out. That was my fault. All right, here, let's look at, uh, this was the last one I found. As you can see, I've got the rings here. So it's clearly a, a mini ball, but it struck a tree or somebody or something. I could get in here and dig a lot of this dirt out, but I just left it as is. This bullet, um, of course, you can really see the rings there. And this is not uncommon. When they hit something, they tended to tumble and smack, and they really left some nasty, nasty holes. And um, anyways... I washed it in some water. I mean, I didn't get a toothbrush out and scrub it, but I, I did try to get all the dirt off this one. And then here's my pistol ball. This could have been a Union or Confederate pistol ammunition, but as you see, it's, it, it's almost as if it's a round ball that has struck something and broken half. When you look here, this, if this round ball were to go through a, a pistol barrel, you can clearly see right there there is some striations in the lead that would be in keeping with the rifling of a uh, of a pistol. So anyways, there's my three Civil War bullets. One in perfect condition, two uh, mini balls in fired condition, and then a piece of a um, pistol ball. I probably went a little long on the history lesson, but I love history. It fascinates me. That's what makes old stuff cool old stuff, a good story. And uh, that story's true. And uh, these bullets are real, and I'm glad that I found them. They mean a lot to me. I'd never sell them. But when I'm gone, if my kids want to melt them down and uh, make new bullets out of them, that's fine. After I'm gone, they can do whatever they want with them. But I'll never get rid of them. They're my little pieces of Civil War history from a battle fought in my area. Even though the Confederates lost and were outnumbered and surprised by the Union, it's still pretty cool old stuff. So thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.